Many people around the world don't truly comprehend just how large Australia is. Now, I, as a Victorian resident, don't exactly live in the most vast area here in Australia. But most people outside of New Zealand and Australia don't realise that it's actually a three and a half hour flight from west coast to east. And given how isolated Australia is from the rest of the first world, ports along the east coast of Australia aren't always the most strategically convenient for airlines. Now what do I mean by that? I mean that if Bojo wants to fly from London to Australia to host an exclusive mid-lockdown surprise birthday party for ScoMo, well the Boris Mobile can't exactly fly directly from London to Sydney. There are only two ports that are well positioned to handle Melbourne to London routes, and one of them just came out of one of the longest and most strict shutouts of the entire COVID pandemic. And if you haven't guessed where I'm going with this, then maybe this will help. been happening behind the scenes and readiness for the opening. The two year long project, one of only a handful to continue during the pandemic. Perth, Western Australia in 1942. That's where the story of Perth Airport begins. When the federal government of the time commissioned the conversion of Dunriath Golf Course into an RAAF base that would operate until the end of World War II. In that three year period between 42 and 45, two runways were built at the base. In 1944, the government decided to allow both Qantas and ANA, no, 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 not that ANA, this ANA, to operate flights in and out of the aerodrome. For larger aircraft, the now named Guildford Aerodrome became the primary airfield. This remained the status quo until September of 1952 when Guildford was renamed Perth Airport, with a large new terminal development taking place just six months later in March of 1953. The development was extensive, an entirely new international terminal was completed at a cost of $180,000 and the terminal was built using second-hand wartime materials, very similar to the historic time that the brave hens and roosters of Yorkshire Chicken Farm repurposed their entire prisoner of war barracks into a large chicken scale B-52 Strata Fortress as they escaped the clutches of the vicious Mrs. Tweedy. Okay, I know I got a little carried away there, but it is a truly inspiring story. So anyway, finally, nine years after the terminal's completion, all domestic airlines moved from the RAAF hangars into the new terminal, making it Perth's first combined domestic and international terminal. Operations continued like this for the 18 years following until November of 1980 when the Federal Transport Minister Ralph Hunt announced a new terminal would be built. Four years later in 86, Mr Beers himself unveiled the shiny new $60 million international terminal on the eastern side of the airport, complete with a new control tower too. Hey and speaking of towers, I bet you sunk a few after the unveiling too, am I right Bob mate? Then to align with the rest of Australia's larger airports, in 1988 management of Perth Airport was assumed by the newly formed Federal Airports Commission. The FAC oversaw some sizeable changes in Perth Airport's landscape in the years following. In the early 90s, the FAC overhauled the entire retail sector of Perth Airport along with the redevelopment of the domestic airport facilities operated by ANSET, Qantas and other Australian airlines. It wasn't too long after that that on the 2nd of July 1997, Perth Airport Proprietary Limited, formerly West Australia Airports Corporation Proprietary Limited, took up a 99 year leasehold interest over Perth Airport as part of the first phase of the privatisation of airports in Australia. And then finally, in 1999, a long favourite of mine finally came into fruition. The FAC finally developed a 20-year master plan. Unfortunately, the only way I can view it is to fly to Perth and see the hard copy for myself. And that's exactly what I did, is what I wish I could say. But as you can tell by my botched uploading schedule, I haven't quite had the time to fly there. 
What I do know is that the master plan included some major upgrades and improvements to the international terminal due to the incredible exponential rate of passenger growth through Perth Airport. The upgrade would include a 2,500 square metre floor space expansion and a huge new duty-free shopping area for travelling international passengers. It would make room for more check-in areas, screening and immigration halls and improved baggage handling and screening systems. The master plan also included new extended and widened taxiways to support larger aircraft such as 747s and A380s. And contrary to most master plans, construction began within a few years of the master plan's publication. And as mentioned in all Aussie or Kiwi aviation videos, an event that happened in 2001 RIP ANSAT meant that ANSAT's share of the domestic terminal was divided up amongst the remainder of the airlines operating domestically into and out of Perth. Which brings us to 2004 the year of Perth Airport's 60th birthday. And in celebrating 60 years, the airport opened the sparkly new Taxiway Sierra. This thing was hot. Okay, maybe not Chris Hemsworth hot, but certainly a solid Liam Hemsworth level. But more like Liam Hemsworth in Hunger Games, in that it's there, it's important to the story, but people don't really notice it, and it certainly wasn't the focus of the first few years. Then in 2005 and 2006, the main development of the International Terminal, now known as T1, took place at a cost of $25 million. In 2008, Perth Airport welcomed its first A380 flight as part of Qantas's A380 promotional tour of Australia. Interestingly, the second A380 flight into Perth was an Emirates A380 flight that underwent an emergency landing into Perth Airport after a passenger suffered a stroke en route to Sydney. Also in 2008 came a Capital Works investment of a further $100 million into the airport's future. And in early 2009, a $21 million apron development was completed in line with the 1999 master plan, followed a year later by a $9 million upgrade to Terminal 3 and 4 forecourts. And this is where things get a little... Uh, rough. You see, in 2012, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission released a report rating Perth Airport as the worst in Australia, as judged by the airlines. The same report rated it below satisfactory for the second year in a row. So, while Perth was all excited about all the gradual upgrades taking place to their airport, the rest of Australia's major airports were, as the great Chevy Chase puts it, Streets ahead. Know what I mean? I don't. But yet, just four years later in 2016, Perth Airport was somehow voted Airport of the Year? The primary reason being that the development plans for the airport's future were extensive and impressive. And in February of 2013, Terminal 2 was officially opened. Functioning as a domestic terminal, it included new baggage claims, check-in counters, security screening systems, and 50 new aircraft parking bays, 14 of which were accessible via JetBridge. Then in 2015, the planned $80 million Terminal 1 International Arrivals expansion was completed. Airport Drive opens and connects Perth Airport to the new Gateway WA interchange, and the $220 million Terminal 1 domestic section opens, becoming home to Virgin Australia's domestic services. The area of which was home to a very interesting standoff between Virgin Australia and Perth Airport later on in the piece. Now, Perth Airport did something in 2016 that made it the only airport in Australia to do so, and as far as anyone can tell, it will stay the only airport to have done this. In 2016, Perth Airport welcomed the world's largest ever aircraft, the Antonov AN-225 Maria. This wasn't just any normal landing. The arrival of this aircraft drew in a crowd upwards of 15,000 spectators who all turned out to view what would be its only visit to Australia before its tragic destruction earlier this year in 2022. Also in 2016 began the true transformation of Perth as a utility to airlines. Because while up to this point many airlines had used Perth Airport as a pit stop on the way to the East Coast, the rapid evolution of commercial aircraft now meant that airlines were gradually increasing their long-haul non-stop flights from Australia to the other side of the world. Take Qantas for example, who in December of 2016 announced it would be flying direct flights from Perth to London Heathrow. This was it. Finally, Australians could fly on their national carrier to London via Perth. To accommodate this milestone, Qantas poured some money into further developing domestic terminals 3 and 4 to streamline the process of taking passengers from the East Coast 
through Perth Airport on their way to Europe. Once these upgrades were complete, the existing Qantas flights to Singapore and Auckland were also shifted to fly out of Terminals 3 and 4. Okay, so now you know where Perth Airport has come from and how it's grown. And I bet you're keen to see what's in store, because as far as Aussie airports go, Perth has one of the brightest futures in aviation. And guess what? You're gonna have to wait until next time. On a serious note, I do feel sad that it's taken me four months to push out another video, but as you'll soon see in a video that I have in the works, there's good reason for why I've been too busy to push out a video. Working in the aviation industry right now is grueling and all will be revealed very soon. Until next time, thanks for watching, consider subscribing and I'll see you in the next one.